I have been reading the book Battlefield America. I actually finished it quite a while ago, but I keep referring back to it. And after my incident yesterday with the popo in uh, in my hometown, it it really hit home to me. And so I had already had the interview scheduled with John, but I've got the book here, and you guys can see this if you're watching the video version of the show at jasonstapleton.com. But normally the way I do this is as I'm finding stuff that I want to talk about in the book or, or references that I think are great, I always read with a highlighter. And what I tend to do is go back through and put sticky tabs over the stuff that I think is really good. And normally I'll have, you know, three or four different things and topics that I really think kind of harness and, 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 and the, the entire concept of the book. In this case, I have like 18 of them. So I don't, I'm basically just going to work through these with, uh, with John as best I can and, and try and encapsulate for you the real danger that we face by the militarization of our police and, and the, you, your right, the violation of your rights almost on a daily basis now. And, uh, and so I'd like to welcome John to the show. John, thank you so very much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks for having me on the show, Jason. All right, perfect. Well, I want to start off, I think there is a quote here right near the beginning of your book that kind of encapsulates what the book is about, and I want to read it for the audience. It says, we have moved beyond the era of representative government and entered a new age. Let's call it the age of authoritarianism. History may show that from this point forward, we will have left behind any semblance of constitutional government and entered into militaristic state where all citizens are suspect and security trumps freedom. That is an incredibly bold and powerful statement to make uh, in the front of this book. Talk to me a little bit about why you decided to write the book, because, it, I mean, you're, you're exposing a lot of stuff here that no one has been willing to say, and, uh, and it's really scary. I mean, I read what, what, uh, what uh, Andrew Napolitano said about the book, and when I got done, I felt the same way. He said, it, it's hard to sleep at night after you read this stuff. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, what I, you know, why I wrote the book was is because uh, I'm an attorney. I'm president of the Rutherford Institute. We do handle cases, some strange cases where people are getting pulled from their homes for Facebook posts and put in jail. Some in mental hospitals. We file lawsuits and get them out. I've have seen the cases. Uh, I read continually about what's going on across the country. Uh, when I grew up as a kid, uh, my next door neighbor was the police chief. He didn't carry a gun. I called him Scotty. One day I asked him, I said, how come you don't carry a gun, Scotty? He says, I don't want to shoot anybody. Uh, that was the kind of policeman I grew up with. But I'd say over the last 20 years, uh, I've been, I, I would, I use the word shocked. I've been shocked into reality. The, the way police view us, uh, has changed radically, um, and I've worked with a lot of policemen across the country, mostly older seasoned policemen who they're shocked too. They tell me they don't like the way policemen are moving. They don't like the way they're trained in the academies or the militaristic point of view. In fact, I have a friend who teaches the Fourth Amendment, which is, you know, the, the provision of our Constitution says that the police can't touch you or do surveillance unless they have probable cause, unreasonable search and seizure. He says, John, I'm known as the anti-cop. <laughs> when, when he first said that, I said, why? He says, I teach the Fourth Amendment. So things have changed. Uh, the old idea of uh, us looking like, you know, people with worth and dignity, that's not how the government views us today. Or they wouldn't be doing the surveillance they do on us. Um, and, and again, uh, NSA reform stuff, I've, I've, I wrote Congress, every congressman, and said, do not pass the USA Freedom Act. I've read it. It does not do reform. It actually expands the police state. So... What we live in today, I would say, is a surveillance state, and we're, all, we're transitioning, in my opinion, uh, basically into a very authoritarian, totalitarian government where if Americans are not careful, most of them are going to wake up one day and look around and go, what happened? Because they're distracted. Because we're all sitting watching devices today, we're watching television, whatever we're doing, we're not paying attention. The average American I talk to has no idea what's in the Bill of Rights. They don't know. They don't keep up with it. I talk to seasoned journalists. I say, do you know there are 80,000 SWAT team raids occurring across America where cops are going through people's doors, where 80% of those raids, they used to show up at your door and knock on the door for warrant service? They don't do that anymore. They just assume they can do anything they want to do. So we do live in an authoritarian state. It's all there. How many people realize the NSA, despite reform, whatever, downloads 2 billion of our emails a day, 400 million text messages. They admit to hacking into 160,000 Facebook pages a day to see what we're doing. 
watching. Well, let me ask you that sp- specifically about the, the Freedom Act, because I covered that in the first segment here this morning and just discussing a little bit about how it, it would appear as though in the law that what they have simply done is they've said, well, we're not going to collect the data anymore. We're just going to make it a requirement that the, the owners of that data collect and store it by Verizon and AT&T, and then we get to have access to whatever we want whenever we want it. Do I understand the law correctly? You understand it correctly. Okay. That's exactly. And yet, by the way, that was, uh, that was the advice that the former NSA director, Clapper, said. He said, why don't you hand over the phone companies? They'll deflect criticism of what we're doing. He actually said that. Well, and I, I thought, well, that's so genius. So it's a PR move, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I was like, well, why didn't they do that earlier? Headlines today and the major newspapers, they all fell for it. Mm-hmm. But they haven't, they're haven't. they not lawyers. They're not, they're not really educated citizens. They haven't studied it very carefully, mm-hmm. so they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, no, that, that that's unfortunate. Uh, I, I'm I'm reading here in, inside the book. One of the things that that you ran across is is you said um, that the average American commits three felonies a day without even knowing that he's committing felonies. And it, it it would seem to me that what you're saying is we have a combination of several problems. Number one is that we have we have a sense that the government can violate the Constitution and can violate civil liberties if it believes that it has a compelling interest in providing for security. That also it's beginning to train its cops, its police forces around the United States to put officer safety above anything else. Yeah. And then they're combining that with laws that make it virtually impossible for any American citizen to not be a criminal if the government wants to target you. Is, would, would that be fair? Absolutely correct. We see the cases. I mean, you know, an old lady in Florida, 80 years old, feeding birds in her front yard. She found out it was illegal, but she got arrested and led into a courtroom in handcuffs. The fellow in Texas had just spent 17 days in jail for overgrown grass, a janitor. He gave up his uh, vacation time to serve the jail time. Uh, I'm seeing those cases. We get the cases where people have a single chicken in their backyard. Police arrive, confiscate it. You can't have a chicken in your backyard for eggs. A veteran who wants a vegetable garden, it's against the law in his local community. But the key, the point I'm saying here, and I get this question all the time when I speak, if I'm not doing anything wrong, what's the hassle, what's that? Well, you don't realize you are doing something wrong with all the laws, but uh, almost 5,000 federal crimes, uh, all the regulatory crimes uh, at the federal level, local level, whatever, you don't know. If they want to target you, and and the cases are really clear, uh, cases I've been involved in, at least consulting where people are, are trying to stage a free free speech protest. The FBI is reading all the text messages and emails people getting together and they go in a week before the protest and ask for an interview and try to intimidate people. I even see that with talk show hosts that we've helped out. Mm-hmm. They F- FBI shows up, tries to quiet them down for the criticism they're doing on the government. They want an interview. We back off the FBI, but if we weren't there or some other group weren't there, people are going to, you know, they're, they're watching. So they're, they are trying to intimidate people, obviously. But again, if you're doing something they don't like, you can get targeted. And I guarantee that, folks, because I've seen cases. What would you say to the criticism um, that there are 300 million Americans in this country, and what you're really doing throughout the course of your book, there's no doubt that these are real cases, but you've simply just cherry-picked the absolute worst, the atrocities uh, of, uh, of certain police departments at certain years, and that this isn't really as pervasive a problem as, as you're making it out to be in your book, that really these are just some isolated incidents over the years that, uh, that, that, that take care of themselves. And as a whole, we're really okay, and, 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 and it's really not as bad as you make it out to be. Well, the United States has the largest prison population in the world. Uh, you know, private prisons popping up everywhere. People are sitting in jail for minor uh, marijuana offenses. They're making products in private prisons for Microsoft. Uh, and I detail this in my book. The private industry is going. A lot of people coming over the border right now, by the way, so-called immigrants, are going into private prisons where they're making products for corporations. By the way, as I detail in my book, Auschwitz, the, not, the Nazi German concentration camp, the notorious one, was a private prison. And that's another thing I would like, may want to point out. We're kind of following, the, in my opinion, what former regimes have done. And we're falling in line with history. We're kind of repeating it. And, and I'll go back and say again, the great sci-fi writers like Huxley, Orwell, Philip K. Dick predicted that was the direction we were going. They saw it early on. And as I'm saying, uh, right now, it seems to be uh, like we're transitioning into an authoritarian state where, by the way, Alex Huxley said people will love their servitude. 
with, with the average American watching 150 hours of television a month, the average young person now up to eight hours a day on some kind of screen device, we're not paying attention. So yeah. it'll be a controlled situation. It's already happening, folks. And as the book, I argue we're, we're moving into something very similar to The Matrix, the movie Matrix, where you'll not be able to know exactly what's going on most of the time. Most of the people are into virtual reality right now, either video games, television. How do you know what's going on if you're watching CNN? or the other news channels, you don't, because you're not getting the news, folks. Well, As I show in my book, it's not what's reported, it's what's not reported. So the average American doesn't know all the facts that I'm saying here because they're not paying attention. Well, not only that, we, we talked about in the first segment the, the cooperation between government and the media, and, and I, I interviewed and, and had a chance to talk with Ben Swan uh, last week about how media is is co-opted by government. And in reading your book, I, I see the same thing here, Carl uh, Bernstein yeah, talking Carl about Bernstein. C CIA cooperation. And I just want to quote here from your book. He said, other organizations which cooperate with the CIA include the American Broadcasting Company, the National Broadcast Company, the Associated Press, United Press International, Reuters, Hearst Newspapers, Script Howard, Newsweek Magazine, uh, Mutual Broadcast System, Miami Herald, uh, Saturday Evening Post, New York Herald Tribune. You say, in other words, the news, quote unquote, we receive is routinely edited by government surveillance agents. So, I, I mean, that's according to Carl Bernstein, you know, Watergate thing. Yes, so. yeah, and that, and that is that that would be the the major news, every major news outlet in in the United States. And wh what is the, the what is the answer to to that? Is alternative media really the answer? Is is that the way we're going? Is it is you're gonna, are you going to have to start getting your news fractured from from various sources that are that are not co-optable or co or corruptible? Oh yeah, uh, I don't. Listen, when I read in the Washington Post or whatever, uh, the, the articles on the USA Freedom Act, I looked at them today and went, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Who are these guys? They, they either are numb to reality or, I mean, I don't, I'm not conspiracy theorist. I don't know. I think most of them are just busy and not paying attention. But, yeah, I think alternative media shows like yours, getting on the Internet, reading the different articles, Collating it all and seeing where it heads, double checking your facts, by the way, you have to do that. Uh, that's all I do. I, some days I read five hours a day, and that's from the internet. Yeah. That's where I get my news. I don't listen. Am I going to listen to George Stephanopoulos, who gave what thousands upon thousands of dollars to the Clintons just recently, or Jay Carney on CNN, who used to, he's a now a commentator for CNN, but he out of the Obama White House? Listen, journalists didn't used to come out of politics, they didn't used to be like that. So, we live, in a, we live in a celebrity atmosphere like, right now where people listen to celebrities who, in my opinion, most of the time their lips are moving and, you, they, you know, what, what are they saying? But uh, to be honest with you, I turned the television set off about three years ago. I haven't watched television in three years. And you know what? I don't <laughs> know most of the things about Brad Pitt's pimples or the stuff that people – when I – listen – when I, I spoke at a conference a couple weeks ago, and I picked up USA Today and looked at it. You know what the lead story was? It was on a deflated football with Tom Brady. That's all the front page was about. <laughs> right. And I said, You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, we are. We're we're, we're in the process of not talking. We we we, we have that, a we have a no a, a no a policy on never talking about Tom Brady on this show. But the point is, it's ridiculous. It doesn't mean anything. It, it's not what's going on. When you have uh, the first two months of this year. Uh, more people killed in this country by policemen than, than in the other six industrialized countries of the world, and that's a, a major, bl a minor blip somewhere on the internet. Those yeah. kind of stories, and you, you know, know that I, in the major newspapers. I think one of the most compelling things that that you write in the book, in in terms of just how bad it has gotten, is you say that at least 400 to 500 innocent people are killed by police officers every year. Indeed, Americans are now eight times more likely to die in a police confrontation than they are to be killed by a terrorist. And let and yet all the entire focus is built around protecting us from terrorism, even at the cost of hundreds of innocent lives a year. And you go on to say there has been a notable buildup in recent years, and this is something I didn't know, of SWAT teams with non-security related federal agencies such as the Department of Agriculture, the Railroad Retirement Board apparently has its own SWAT team, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Office of Personnel yeah. Management, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, 
and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, including the, the Education Department also apparently has its own SWAT team. The Department of Education has been doing SWAT team raids for overdue loans. Throwing people down their lawn. Well, what is, what, why, why is the department, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about so a guy doesn't pay his, uh, his, uh, uh, the, his bill people can for college. The, the Kenneth Wright case, they raided his home, threw him face down the lawn, SWAT team for an overdue loan that his wife, she wasn't even there. I think they'd gotten separated. Wow. Uh, and that's another thing. They're usually in the wrong home. But there is a paranoia in government today. And, it's, and by the way, I think a lot of people are starting to get paranoid out in America, too, because they're reflecting what's happening with the government. But one thing we haven't talked about was that the government's actually, uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security contracted to buy 1.6 million hollow point bullets for use by their agents, which, it, which when they hit your body, they expand. Uh, they violate international law. Department of Fisheries, Agriculture, Social Security Administration purchased hollow point bullets. Who's using those hollow point bullets? They're SWAT teams, obviously. So you ha we have federal agents now armed to the hilt with bullets that violate international law. The, the same bullet that went through uh, John Kennedy's head and blew half his head off the bat. John Lennon, the Beatle, by the way, was hit with five hollow point bullets in his chest. Um, government bullets, by the way. And I'm not saying the government shot them, but people can come to their own conclusions. The thing is, is that uh, we're dealing with, uh, I think, a very paranoid institution that's freaked out by a certain segment of America, the dissenters, gun owners, by the way, out there. They're totally freaked by people. Returning veterans, we get the cases. Again, we had the case with Brandon Robb, the young Marine, 26 years old, who was pulled out of his home for Facebook posts, anti-Obama Facebook posts. He's an I-11 truther. Uh, his mother called me. He was at the jail. I, I asked the police chief what he had done, what crime he had committed. They handcuffed him behind his back and slammed him against the fence. And I said, what did he do? And he said, he's committed no crime, the police chief told me. We're just concerned about his Facebook post. They actually put him in a mental hospital. We had to file a lawsuit to get him out of the hospital. The judge really shouldn't have been, been in there in the first place. But that's the kind of government you deal with. I think we're dealing with some paranoid people that are protecting, I would call, the corporate elite right now. And as, as you know, I point out in my book, Princeton University did an exhaustive study of American policies over the last 20 years, came to the conclusion that we live in an oligarchic elite. And the face of that oligarch, oligarchic elite right now is the police you're seeing, and I'm not just talking about local police, I'm talking about the federal police, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Agriculture, IRS has a SWAT team, mm -hmm. SWAT teams. Well, the book is incredible. The, the book is called Battlefield America, The War on the American People, and I would, I would highly recommend the book to everyone. I don't do a lot of book recommendations. We don't have a ton of authors on the show. This book really was incredible. It's incredibly well researched. You document where where all of the cases are in the book. So it's it's not just somebody coming up with wild and crazy stories they pulled off the internet. Everything is documented in there. Uh absolutely love it. John, thank you so very much for being on the show and uh and I wish you the best of luck. Let us know how we can help you. And hey, keep up your good work. Keep sounding the alarm, buddy. Thank you, sir. Thank you.